Welcome to today's panel discussion on building smarter portfolios using factor models across the investment process. I'm Frank Smetana, Product Marketing Manager at Charles River, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Joining me are Katya Techa and Dan DiBartolomeo. Welcome. Katya leads the Risk Product Management Group at Charles River with over 20 years experience in buy-side financial services, specializing in financial risk modeling, analytics, derivatives, and fixed income securities. Dean is the founder and president of Northfield Information Services. Before starting Northfield, Dean served as director of research at a New York-based investment firm where he was responsible for investment strategy and equity, fixed income, and derivatives research. With that, let's get started. Dean, set the stage for us. What are factor models, and why have they become an important tool in the buy-side investment process? Factor models are really just a way of describing cause and effect relationships in financial markets that, if, that impact more than one security at a time. We all understand that, for example, if energy costs go up or interest rates change or investors develop a lack of confidence in what's going on in the markets, this may impact, for example, their preference for owning large cap stocks versus small cap stocks. So factor models are just a way of identifying what are the key drivers of investor behavior, what's driving what's going on in the financial markets over time, and particularly which of those items is likely to be persistent in the long run uh, because it's structural. There's a reason for these things. Katya, let's start our discussion of the investment process with portfolio construction. How are investment firms using factor exposures to construct more robust portfolios? Traditionally, investors used um, classifications such as sector or geography or currency to manage their risks. So they might say something like, I want 30% of my risk in the technology sector. What that really meant, 30% of my securities will be in the technology sector or 20% in the U.S. Factors, however, allow you to have a much more accurate view of your risk exposures. Any given security will actually have exposures to multiple risk factors. For example, a, a company might be a large cap and a value stock and in the technology sector and in the U.S. How do you combine or how do you evaluate the exposures to all those different risk factors? Well, that's where factor models can help. Factor models allow you to first measure how much exposure does each security have to each of the given risk factors? So for example, it might have a 10% exposure to value factor and 20% exposure to the size factor, large cap factor. And then you can see across your portfolio, what are your exposures to each of these factors? So not just by sector, for example, by by sector, large cap versus small cap, value versus growth, and, and so on and so forth. You can have other factors such as momentum or yield or dividends. Once you have those exposures at the portfolio level, you can much more accurately um, predict what your risk will be in the portfolio and that way much more accurately measure how, mu how much you want to invest in a particular sector or in a particular security and have your risk exactly match your investment views and your investment philosophy. So following on, traditionally portfolio managers viewed risk relative to a benchmark to identify it active risk. Factor models now provide managers with a much deeper understanding of the risks impacting their portfolios. How does that happen? How do we use factor models to do that? Well, the, the key thing is to understand that uh, your benchmark relative performance arises from the differences between your portfolio and whatever the benchmark is. Uh, and so to the extent you are different, you have the opportunity to outperform or underperform. Those differences are going to arise in two ways. First, things which are intentional. I choose as a portfolio manager to do certain things that I believe will add return to my portfolio. The other differences which may arise may be incidental. I may be investing in certain companies that I think are well managed or have good products, but I didn't think very much about how they might be impacted by a change in the macro economy or inflation or interest rates. And so you really have to think about it in two ways. The tracking error measure, the active risk measure, can tell us two things. First, what is the potential to add or subtract performance by virtue of the choices we have made in our 
investment process. The other is the potential for adding to or subtracting from performance by virtue of things on which we have no opinion, things which have arisen incidentally in the nature of the portfolio. And if you think about it from a sort of conceptual perspective, that second category is often more telling. Uh, you know, if I'm about to cross a street and I look both ways, it's unlikely I'm going to get hit by a car. Uh, when I get hit by a car, it's because I didn't see the car coming. And so typically, factor models can both tell us more and more in more detail what we already understand about our portfolios, what we as portfolio management people have chosen to do, but they can also bring to light the things we haven't thought about. And those are perhaps the more dangerous things in terms of performance. So Katya, let's pivot now and discuss how volatility is used to quantify absolute risk contribution. To, to echo what Dan said, it's unintentional risks that are key to, to managing risk. It's not those, those risks relative to the benchmark or to the, uh, to the absolute risk that you take that you wanted to. It's those that you weren't even aware that you were taking. Factor models allow us to project um, risk in the portfolio going forward. So not just looking in the past and saying what the volatility has been, but projecting forward volatility. And absolute volatility as opposed to relative, which is tracking error, allows us to see what the volatility of the portfolio as a whole will be. That's actually oftentimes the much more important measure for, for investors, not the portfolio managers, but the, their clients, than the tracking error, which is relative to the benchmark. If the benchmark loses 15% and your portfolio only loses 10%, that might be a sign of a good portfolio manager, but that's not so great for your portfolio as a whole. So absolute risk measures are useful for invest, investment management clients to understand what risks they're taking, irregardless of what the benchmark itself is doing. I think a key issue with factor models is that we can understand how factor exposures go across many securities. For example, if I thought about, let's say, investing in an airline, I would say, gee, an airline might be risky because if energy costs go up, fuel prices go up, that's risky to the airline. On the other hand, if I looked at, let's say, an oil company, well, they benefit from an increase in energy costs, in oil prices, in jet fuel prices. So if I can construct a portfolio that has perhaps an airline that I really like and an oil company I really like, I can offset those two risks and make the risk of the portfolio less than the risk of either position independently. So what factor models really do well is allow us to understand risk across the portfolio as a whole, not just at the individual security level. The ability to decompose risks via factors is a useful tool for both active and passive managers. Let's explore that in more detail. For passive portfolio managers, factor analysis is really important as well. Passive portfolio managers are trying to match an index or a benchmark, and they want to do that at the lowest possible cost, so not having as many positions as an index might have. And factors really help with that because they allow them to, to manage their exposures to each of the risk factors with, rather than just looking at sector allocations, let's say, or country allocations, and much more accurately mirror an index with a much smaller, potentially, set of securities. They can then use um, tools such as an optimizer, which is also typically based on factor models, to really construct an optimal portfolio, reducing the difference between an index and the passive portfolio. Dan, what role do factor models play in portfolio optimization? Well, if you think about what an optimization actually is, it's a really simple process. It's saying, take all the securities, all the positions in my portfolio, rank them from the ones I like the best down to the ones I like the worst, and I'm going to take some of the money that's invested in the worst ones and buy some of the, one, buy some of the positions that I think are the best. Um, and then I'm going to repeat that process until all the, portfolio, all the security positions in the portfolio look about equally good to me. Uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, what's driving that process of what do I think is best and what do I think is worst is the trade-off between expected returns, what are the positions in which I have the most confidence that they're going to outperform, and the risks involved. And of course the factor models are going to be driving how much risk I perceive at the position level. Uh, and this will lead me to either change my position sizes or it will lead me 
uh, to make different trade-offs because I think that depending on how the different securities are correlated across the portfolio, I want different degrees of uh, diversification versus concentration in the portfolio. But I think one of the things that factor models can do is help demystify the whole idea of optimization. It's not a black box. It's nothing different than what a human portfolio manager would do. It's just a whole lot faster. So moving on across the investment process, performance measurement and attribution are often still separate from the risk function in most buy-side firms. How is the use of factor-based attribution changing that dynamic? So we talked about that portfolio managers often use factor-based tools to do portfolio construction, and they want to make bets, whether intentional or unintentional, on those factors. Well, once you do that, you really want to measure were those intentional or even unintentional bets, were they good, successful bets or, or not, and maybe change strategy based on that. And that's where portfolio management and attribution comes in. Attribution allows you to attribute your over or under performance to certain factors. Now, traditionally, this was pretty simplistic. We attributed performance to either <coughs> allocation to certain sectors or selection of the particular um, stock within a given sector, let's say. That's a good way when your investment management process is doing the same thing, where it's first doing allocation based on sectors and then doing selection within those sectors. If your investment management process now switches to use factor-based exposures, you want to do the same thing in the attribution process. You want to mirror the way you evaluate managers to the way they construct their portfolio. So you can really measure how is their process working, and then you can see uh, whether certain factors whether certain factors overperformed or underperformed, and whether the particular managers picked the right factors and the right allocations within those factors. I think the other thing that goes to Katya's point that's very important is that in a formal risk model, we're talking about uncertainty. We're talking about the likelihood that things will go well or the likelihood things will go poorly. Um, in the attribution process, we can use that same information to determine the likelihood that we would have gotten a particularly good result or a particularly bad result just as a matter of dumb luck. And when we do those kind of evaluations over time, we can actually learn what are we good at? What do we do consistently poorly? And so it's a much more rich exercise in terms of being able to determine what are the strengths and weaknesses of our investment process. Because not only do we know what happened, we have a sense of the range of things that could have happened. And so we understand the result in context. Moving on across the investment process, scenario analysis and stress testing, two very versatile tools that have been important for investment firms for a long time. How is the incorporation of factor models making scenario analysis more realistic for portfolio managers? Katya? So one traditional way, and that's still used today, is for scenario analysis, changing market inputs, such as interest rates or inflation rates or um, FX exchange rates, and seeing how would your portfolio react to those changes. Those stress tests are still useful. They're still part of a lot of the regulatory compliance, for example, Dot Frank, and um, they're still often used across the industry. In those stress tests, you typically change one factor, such as interest rates, or maybe a couple factors together, maybe interest rates and inflation. But you, you're not entering how correlation of those factors actually um, plays out, or whether those scenarios are realistic with respect to each other. So typically, when interest rate change, inflation changes as well, as does effects, um, as do equity prices. But to construct a comprehensive scenario involving all of those market inputs would be very difficult. So a, co a complementary approach is using factors for that. What we can do is we can look at the factor correlations that have happened in the past and we can correlate uh, changes in inflation, interest rates, uh, prepayment rates for mortgages, for example, and any of the other factors such as value, growth, um, and size style factors, and then see if we change just one factor, maybe a couple of factors, so we say, for example, the price of oil from the previous example, if the yeah. price of oil goes up, what else changes? And we can easily say, oh, maybe the currencies of the heavy oil producing countries, such as Russia or Venezuela, um, they go up. But we can also, there's other effects, such as airline stocks or um, oil producing stocks, but even other stocks, uh, for example, uh, consumer 
uh, staples stocks because they do a lot of delivery, so they're also dependent on oil. So there's a lot of cor cross correlations between those factors, and factor models allow us to say shift shift just one or two factors, and the factor model will tell you how what the knock-on mm. effects will be on the rest of the factors. And then you can evaluate the impact on your portfolio, either directly on the portfolio or on the portfolio relative to the benchmark, and see what the impact would be under the various stress scenarios. Now, I don't think that one approach is necessarily better than the other. I think there's value in both. Uh, with the factor-based approach, mm. you're really looking at a lot of the historical information. You're using historical correlations of the factors to predict the future. So it's a good approach when the markets are relatively stable and you want to see whether your portfolio manager or yourself as a portfolio mm. manager have taken undue risk or whether you're hedged in the, in the case of um, changes to the market that are consistent with history. Alternatively, if you want to see what would happen under stresses that have not happened before, if you're looking at maybe a crisis scenario, each crisis is different. We're never going to have a crisis like 2008 or exactly like the dot-com bust. We're going to have other crises in which you can say nothing about other than they will not be exactly like the past ones. And that's where the direct method of shifting different input factors is much more useful because you can construct scenarios that are inconsistent with history. So the combination of those two approaches is really the best uh, stress testing tool and scenario analysis tool. Dion? I think the other thing that's important about understanding factor models in terms of stress testing is they often bring to light relationships that people might think of as unintuitive. Uh, for example, if I said, gee, what happens, which industries do best or worst if oil prices go way up? Um, the sort of knee-jerk reaction of everybody is to say airlines. Fuel prices go up, that makes it very difficult to be a profitable airline. It turns out, as Cotton, you alluded to or just touched on, that the one industry, for example, that gets hurt the worst uh, in a sharp increase in energy costs is actually big box stores. So it's Home Depot, Lowe's, people like that. Why is that? Well, one, they have a big box store. You have to heat it, you have to air condition it, and so on. Two, they sell goods that have to be shipped, and, relative, and the shipping costs are a large part of the economic value. They're not selling you know, diamonds, they're selling concrete. Um, the third is that typically uh, the consumers in those kind of stores are typically middle class families, and if they're spending all their money at the gas pump, they're not shopping. And fourth, uh, you have to drive to those stores. They're not in city centers. Uh, which, again, will make people hesitant in periods of high uh, fuel costs. And if you put all those effects together, it turns out that the earnings of big box stores are incredibly sensitive to energy, uh, and yet that would be something that most uh, investors would find very unintuitive. Why would Home Depot be more uh, sensitive to energy costs than, say, United Airlines? But it's a fact. And it's a fact that you can observe and understand through the context of the factor model. So another interesting use of factor models is an asset valuation. We know that the long stretch of, of zero and near zero interest rates and changes in regulations have forced investment managers out the curve on a search for yield into ever more illiquid instruments. Gotcha, how are factor models helping us value assets more accurately or more realistically? So there has always been a problem of valuing illiquid or privately held or newly issued securities for which market prices, especially future market, projected market prices, are not readily available. And one way to do that is just use what are called replacement securities. So if you have, for example, an IPO in the technology sector, you might use a technology ETF. Uh, or a technology a mutual fund to, to, pro, to mirror those prices. That's not a very accurate approach, um, as can be clearly obvious. Um, an alternative way to do this is to use factor models. Basically, you can say, which factors is this security exposed to? And you can, you, you can do those calculations using very few returns for a given security or some sporadic pricing that, that might be there for an illiquid or privately held instrument. And then once you have those, you can project future prices or current valuation using the prices, the current returns on those factors and the exposure of the security to those factors. So it provides a much more accurate valuation or projections of volatility for that instrument than would a traditional approach of just using some other proxy security. Dion, 
Gaining the benefits of factor models means you have to incorporate them in your technology stack and change the culture of your firm toward a more quantitative approach toward portfolio management and risk. What are your thoughts on that? I think there's really a couple things. Uh, the first one is the idea of time horizon. Are we worrying about risk over the next few days? Or are we worried about risk of how a strategy will perform over the next couple of years? Um, depending on where you sit in the organization, you may care about the short term, you may care about the long term. And one of the biggest problems culturally in organizations is if the different teams are using different systems or different ways of thinking about the problem, then there's going to be conflict in terms of what the folks that are worried about the short term are saying versus the folks that are worried about the longer term. The other thing that's very important is that typically investment managers think of quantitative methods as somehow um, influencing what they get to do. And I don't think that's true. Uh, a factor model is not going to tell you which stock to buy uh, unless your investment process is extremely quantitative. On the other hand, where a factor model can be very valuable, even in a very fundamental setting, would be something like, gee, I'm a portfolio manager. I made a decision today to buy 50,000 shares of IBM in my fund. Why 50,000? Why not 49,000? Why not 52,000? And what the models can be very useful for is to help portfolio managers understand how risks are arising in the portfolio and whether those risks align with what they believe is the potential benefit of a particular position. You obviously want to take big bets on the positions in which you have the most confidence. Uh, you don't want to take a lot of risk in the positions uh, where you have lesser confidence. And by formalizing that process, uh, we can very often help even very fundamental organizations not change how they invest, but how they size positions. And if they size positions in a more purposeful fashion, that can typically help the consistency of performance a great deal while not affecting any other part of the investment process. Katya, can you address the technological considerations for incorporating factor models? So we talked about having factor models used in portfolio construction, performance measurements and attribution, stress testing and scenario analysis, and even valuation. All that uh, relies on the fact that factor models are available in the system and are the same and consistent across the technology uh, for various parts of the organization. So what that requires is really having one platform with one set of data, both in terms of the factor models themselves, but also in terms of trades, positions, um, security data such as reference data like prices and um, any other relevant characteristics. So one platform, one set of data that's available across the organization for, for everybody. That's one key, um, key tenet here. The other key point is having that data on a really consistent uh, basis and having it accurate. If you don't have accurate data, either for factor models or for prices and trades, you're obviously not going to get the accurate results that you'd want. So having data pumped in, into the system correctly is very important. Now, how do you do that? One good answer is have using SaaS, which is software as a service, so that the software provider, the technology provider, is actually responsible for giving you data and making sure that the data is accurate and seamlessly delivered to all the users of the, of the technology, be they portfolio managers, performance ma management um, experts, or be they in compliance, for example. So having one set of data that's managed and accurate and one set of um, technology across the organization, that's really, I think, the key for this process to be successful. Thank you, Katya, and thank you, Dan, for sharing your thoughts with us today. And thank you for joining us. We hope you found our discussion on using factor models across the investment process informative, and we're happy to take any questions. Contact us at crd.com.